ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا. All praise and thanks is due to Allah. We praise Allah. We seek assistance and forgiveness from Allah. قال الله تعالى في القرآن الكريم إنه لقرآن كريم في كتاب مكنون لا يمسه إلا المطهرون. This comes from Surah Waqiyah. Verse 77 to verse 79, in which Allah sways by this Quran, and Allah says, Indeed, this is the Quran. Um, but it is a Quran that is well guarded in a bigger script than the Quran itself. And I will explain that now. And then Allah says, And none will touch it except those who are pure. Okay. So, when Allah says this is the Qur'an that we've given you, but it is well guarded within a bigger script, right? We, uh, we call it the Lawh al-Mahfuz, which is a, a kind of code that Allah has, uh, the whole existence, the whole creation is encoded into a system. And the Qur'an is just part of that code. Okay? So yes, there's a particular respect that comes with handling the Qur'an, right? And therefore Allah says that if you're not pure, you know, the Qur'an won't touch you. Now, this word masa, right? There's two types of touching in Arabic. One is lamasa, right, which is to physically touch. And one is masa. Now the Qur'an, for example, in, in two other places also uses the word masa. For example, Allah would say, لا يمسهم فيها النصب, right? No fatigue will touch them. And then Allah says, لا يمسهم السوء Evil will not touch them. So this is not a physical touch, right? So often people use this verse of the Quran and says, this is the verse that says you have to take wudu before you can read the Quran. Yes, obviously that is part of the respect of the Quran is that when you're going to be engaging with something that is as holy as that, you're not going to go when you just came from your, from your bed with your partner, for example. Or when you just came from the toilet and you didn't clean yourself. That's, we have a certain ethic around how we approach the Qur'an. But this is not what the Qur'an is talking about. This is a different kind of touch, right? So when you are not pure at heart, when you engage with the Qur'an for the wrong reasons, right? when you have not understand the concept of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim that at the beginning of every verse before you engage with it, the Qur'an won't touch you. The message of the Quran won't touch you. <coughs> if you're engaging with the Quran out of a different kind of respect, and I'll talk about that now, you lose the essence of what the Quran is really there for. For example, when it comes to Ramadan, then we start to engage with the Quran. When we want to swear, we'll say Quran ki kasam. You know? When it's uh, weddings and stuff, we take out the Qur'an. The Qur'an is always on top of the cupboard, it's wrapped up in a green cloth, and nobody must touch it, and if the Qur'an falls from there, that's, oh ya Allah, the Qur'an fell down now. So that's how we engage with the Qur'an. But when Aisha radiallahu was asked, what was the character of the Prophet? So she said, khuluquhu al-Qur'an. His character, his whole character was Qur'an. His way of life, he was a walking Qur'an. <coughs> so that is the example that we need to follow, right? How much of the Qur'an is embodied within our systems? So whether they burned Qur'ans in France or in Spain or wherever, that is just a little piece that Allah has given us from the Lawh al mahfuz right? And how does one protect that? It's by protecting the Qur'an within yourselves. Right? Not this paper, because it can be reprinted. There are so many Hufar that have memorized the Qur'an, thousands of them. You can just go around and collect them again. Right? The Qur'an will never be lost. <coughs> Sorry. So that's the beauty of the Qur'an. And also, what we need to take out of the Qur'an is when does the Qur'an become a healing and a mercy for us? Yeah. Allah says, uh, the, uh, Allah has sent the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as Rahmatul Alameen, 
He has a mercy for all of mankind and he has sent with Nabi Muhammad sallallahu a Quran that which is a, a mercy and a healing, rahmah or shifa. So when we engage with the Quran, we must always make sure, ask ourselves a question. Like, what is it in the Quran that I'm going to take out that is going to be of a benefit for myself and for others that I engage with? So if you're going to take out the verse from the Quran and say, see, the Allah says homosexuality is haram because of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Or see, Allah says that, you know, women should be doing this and men should be behave like that. Then you're using the Quran as a punishment. You're not using it as a healing. Right? So we must be very careful how we uh, use the Quran. So what I wanted to do today is to, one of the surahs that I always recite, one of my favorite surahs, um, I wanted to just uh, talk through that surah. Um, the surah says, Sabbih isma rabbika la'ala. Right? Glorify the name of your Lord, the Most High. One of the ways I also want us to learn, and this is why it's important to learn Arabic, because the Quran was revealed in Arabic. And Arabic is one of those languages, one of the oldest forms of language, that inflects in so many different meanings, right? So in order to get the richness out of one verse or even one word that Allah chooses in the Quran, one has to understand Arabic. <coughs> For example, this word sabbah. We use the word subhanallah constantly, right? Means to glorify Allah. It comes from the word sabbah. But the root of sabbah means to swim, right? So what does swimming has to have to do with what sabbah? So Allah is trying to teach us the the uh, uh, you know the the, the parable thing. So when you swim, for example, right, you can't stay underwater, right? You, there's a consciousness that if you're going to be staying underwater, you're going to die, you're going to drown. So you have to constantly come up and take that breath, and then you can go down again, and come up and take that breath and go down again. So that is how we have to engage with Subhan of Allah, right? Is that constantly when we engage with life, we reflect, right? We call Allah's name. Right? We make sure that Allah is always part of our daily activities. That is the meaning of Subhanallah. <laughs> Who creates, then He balances and puts things in proportion. Right? So here Allah is reminding us that everything that Allah has created within the system, within this code of life, is all balanced and proportion. Right? You can't put a blame on Allah and say, you know, Allah is unfair about this or there's injustice about that. Yeah. Obviously, we know that our existence here, you know, we are spiritual beings here having a physical experience. And Allah says in the Quran, you will have to experience covered, uncovered challenges upon challenge because it's through challenges that we grow. Therefore, Deepak Chopra says, if you don't have challenges in your life, you better pray for some. Right? Because it's only through challenges that you grow. So, when Allah created this balance and portion, uh, proportionate uh, uh, proportion, we also have to reflect in our own lives. Because, uh, for example, the, the, the sun comes up in the east and sets in the west. Apple trees don't bear oranges. They all follow a particular system, right? Involuntary. Uh, or, yeah, involuntary. But mankind is the only creature that has this uh, uh, ability to choose. They can voluntarily submit or, or not. Alladhi qaddara fahada. He who decrees and then he guides. So, therefore I was talking about the challenges, right? So if Allah decrees that this is your weakness as insan, as, as humankind, and these are the challenges that I'm going to put in your path, and if you overcome them, you know, you'll become a better person, then that is what Allah has decreed. But with that decree, there's also Allah's guidance. So one should never lose hope that, you know, my challenges are so big and, you know, I feel like I want to commit suicide. الَّذِي أَخْرَجَ الْمَرْعَى فَجَعَلَهُ غُثَاءً أَحْوَى And he who brings forth green pastures, but then you also see how it turns brown and it withers. Right? So why Allah reminds us of this is, this is the same that happens in our life, right? We build something, it breaks down. Nothing is, is permanent, right? But then we have the ability to recreate it again. Right? So Allah does the same. So in that Allah is trying to remind us that nothing that we create in this world is permanent. Right? Everything goes. So why do you want to be attached to those things that are not forever? 
سنبرئك فلا تنسى انما انما شاء الله انه يعلم الجهر وما يخفى we shall make you literate so that you do not forget except which Allah wills you to forget for lo he knows and disclose uh, he knows the disclosed and that which is hidden right so on our journey when we experience these difficulties and challenges this learning Right? Allah says, through that I will make you learn things. I will make you experience things and take the learning with you. And therefore in Islam we make this dua, Allah manfa'ana bima alamtana wa alimna bima yanfa'una. Oh Allah grant us knowledge that is beneficial to us, knowledge that will grow us and keep away knowledge from us that is harmful for us. وَنَيَسِّرُكَ لِلْيُسْرَى فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّ فَأَتِ الذِّكْرَى And we shall ease your way for you um, and therefore remind them uh, for reminders of good for the believers. Right? So whenever we look at a challenge right, and we've overcome the challenge, our state is always better. Right? This knowledge that we have gained, there's, there's, there's um, uh, what do you call this, uh, determination to continue. That's for the person who actually takes the challenge. Right? And so, so this blessing that Allah has given us, Allah instructs in the name of Muhammad Wasallam to talk about that. You know? Talk about where Allah gives you challenges and how Allah guides you through those challenges and how you become a better person. وَيَتَجَنَّبُهَا الْأَشْقَى الَّذِي يَسْلَ النَّارَ ثُمَّ لَا يَمُوتُ فِيهَا وَلَا يَحْيَا So now Allah says that, um, but the sad person is he who does not you know, go through those challenges who's nonchalant about life, ah, oh, I'll do it tomorrow, or ah, oh, that's not important, you know. You'll be flung into a greater fire. Right? Now what does this Nar al-Kubra mean? Often it's translated as Nar al-Kubra is the fire of Jahannam. But Nar al-Kubra is that fire that you experience when you do not work through the challenges. You're sitting there with the demons and you're not willing to work with the demons. You in your comfort zone, and you're not willing to to go out and you know seek uh, different ways of dealing with your challenges. And so you're in this constant depression, you're in constant sadness and in worry. So we fear the big fire, but this is the fire that we really have to fear. <coughs> and then Allah says, "وَذَكَرْ أَسْمَرَ رَبِّهِ فَقَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ تَزَكَّى." And indeed, the person who purifies himself, uh, he is the person uh, who would also remember Allah and he would reflect and pray to Allah. So, just a reminder that, you know, constantly when those challenges happen, you don't have to feel like you're alone. You know, Allah is always there with you. You know, uh, what is that uh, verse? Um, uh, right? Hold on fast to the rope of Allah because the rope of Allah is always extended right, to you. <coughs> so I can go on with this, this uh, surah, but the gist of the surah is that you know, life in this world is full of challenges. We have to keep our faith, we have to trust that Allah is there to help us and assist us through those journeys. And also not to, to think that there's anything special about us that we should not be challenged. Right? It is encoded in, in the system that mankind will be challenged. I was watching this uh, documentary, it's a very short documentary and I encourage you to watch it. On how from a, from a non-Muslim's perspective, people trying to prove that you know, the Quran is, is, is just like the Bible, it's been put together by different people, it's a word that's inspired by God, and it's not really the word of God. And I'm thinking that the Quran so beautifully tells us what's the essence of the Quran, what's the message of the Quran, right? And anything that one can interpret from the Quran that is good for your life and is going to improve you, it's good, right? So why do we have to get into discussions about, is this the word of God? You know, how was it compiled and all of that. And when it comes to the end of the documentary, all that the, the person was trying to prove was that there were different dialects of the Quran written. But if you understand Arabic, 
the different dialects just, just mean that people spoke in different ways, but the message and the root of the, the Arabic language is the same. So still, when there's one word that are, that are used in different ways in different languages, the root of that word will have the same meaning. So uh, it's best that we rather focus on what is the message that the Quran wants to deliver. And if we have that, we will look at any scripture and we will ask what is that message that, that, that is being uh, you know, conveyed through the scripture instead of, of worrying whether the scripture is, a, is really from God or, or not.